people always say that, oh, like it's great to be special, it's good to stand out, and it is, mm. but I think when you have something that forces you to not be normal or yeah. not be like everybody people, else. People look at you differently. People look yeah. at you different. And so then you spend teasing you and exactly. all that. Yeah. So you spend a lot of time mm. just trying to fit in and just be normal and of don't course. stand out. Definitely. So I think that's what I did a, a, a lot in my high school years. I want to introduce yourself and how do you describe yourself in 90 seconds? I'm Jennifer. Mm -hmm. um, I would describe myself as a fun-loving, witty, ambitious creative. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a perpetual optimist, uh, probably to a fault, and I love connecting with people. I love meeting new people, I love hearing their stories, and I just love learning. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. Um, who inspired you to get onto television? Growing up, I, I basically wanted before like my you know tv career or whatnot <laughs> i i wanted to be an actor mm -hmm. i wanted to be a doctor and then there was a point where i basically wanted to be kofi annan and i wanted to like run the united nations mm -hmm. um i had lots of aspirations of things that i wanted to do that i wanted to be a lawyer um i then basically decided my second year of uni that television was what i wanted to do mm -hmm. and um the workshop that was the kind of like my aha moment um, was Charlene White. Um, I don't know if you, she's the ITV newsreader. Um, black heard, lady. Think, yeah. Yeah. Is so she, is she, she quite slim, right? Well, she, yeah, slim. I think no, she's like, she's quite petite. She's got curly, like she's got you know, natural curly hair. Yeah. And yeah, she she does the, the evening news. I think what I've seen. Yeah, on on yeah. ITV. Okay. Yeah. And she, she was part of a panel um, at BBC and I went to a workshop with my friend Camilla because she she was in, wanted to do journalism mm -hmm. and I had no idea really what I was going to, I was just following my friend basically. Mm. Um, I went, Charlene White was on this panel and they were talking about just, you know, just journalism mainly, but also opportunities in television. Mm -hmm. And I just was, I was quite blown away about, about it. You know, and before that I had really, really, kind of idolised Trevor McDonald as well when I was younger. I, was I loved like, him oh as well. He's a I was just like, there's a mm. black guy mm. who reads the news yeah. and he's like, he's so like well-spoken because mm. I'm, I'm quite well-spoken, but when I was younger, I was teased a lot about it. Mm. And like, it genuinely was something that I was like, why do I sound like this? Like, I hate it. Mm. But then my parents would watch the news and I would like listen to Trevor and I was like, this black guy on TV that sounds so well spoken. This is incredible. Like I loved him. Mm. Um, so I was like, maybe I want to be, a, you know, presenter maybe. But then I was like, actually, no, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to be in front of the cameras. Mm. But it was basically through that. So it was kind of a combination of, I guess, inspiration from Trevor McDonald and Charlene White. And I was like, TV is what I want to do. But let me try to navigate how I want to get there. Mm -hmm. And I think um, in that work, BBC workshop, I learned a lot about the production side and like how to be a producer. And I just was like, yeah this is what I want to do. So yeah. How did you get on Channel 4? I'm a television producer and mm -hmm. so I make uh, shows for all sorts of different channels. And recently I worked on a show called High Life um, that went on Channel 4. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, it's probably one of the best things I've worked on um, it just for, all so, for so many reasons. Um, but yeah, so like, I guess it's um, just the shows and the type of shows that I've made that have then gone on Channel 4, mm -hmm. which has been really, um, been really incredible. Mm -hmm. And I still kind of pinch myself that I make stuff that people watch. Yeah. So yeah, so that's... What is your story behind the Craver content and how did you become one? My Insta bio um, has, yeah, Craver of content on there. And I think I've always, I've always been a Craver, like, this is going to sound really mad, but... Um, I just think I've been a massive nerd from like childhood. Like I just, I just like learning and I just like, I really enjoy just getting information and just like knowing things. And I think obviously as the years have gone, that's gone from anything from, you know, I love just reading um, in general, but also just content in all its forms, podcast, you know, YouTube series, films, TV documentaries, just, you know, whatever articles, whatever the, the form that the content comes in. I've realized that actually, I just really like absorbing information. I sort of, <laughs> over the last few years, actually probably since like maybe like my late teens, I kind of give myself a little research project. So I'll be like, oh, I don't know a lot about this thing. And just whenever I have any spare time, I'll just, you, you know, sometimes I'll spend hours, days in, you know, huge like YouTube kind of wormholes, just trying to find as much information about stuff as I can. My friends, think it's hilarious because they'll like call me on a Saturday morning and I'm just I'm like, you know, from six in the morning, I've been up just watching a million YouTube um, 
videos about quantum physics, about, you know, kind of how to solve this theorem, about different wars and things like that. I just, yeah. So I think it's just come from the fact that I just really enjoy learning mm -hmm. and I like finding out things and I like I like how things work. That's, so. that's a good thing because that, that means you're, you're training, you're learning stuff so you can not give knowledge, using getting more knowledge and wisdom so you can help you to help others with your experience of learning. Teaching, I hope so. Teaching others, like I learned something new you telling me what you're doing, that's kind of me making me think, you know, maybe I should go and try and learn something and do something like that as well. I, honestly, I hope so. I mean, I do, <laughs> I do pretty much bore my friends when I learn new stuff. It's like, mm. guys, did you know about this thing? Did yeah. you know about this thing? How interesting is this? Mm. Like, so yeah, so I, I hope that's, you know, it's coming off a no, lot it's of good. people, it's good but yeah, I, I just I like to it. learn new things as well. So it's always good yeah. to learn different things because it can make you like, you know, you can learn things and you can help others, not only just help them, you can like you can be a teacher to people you can teach people train people as well so that's no that is true i mean i used to uh, when i was at uni my part-time job i used to tutor mm -hmm. and i actually do enjoy um just passing on things that i know and like yeah. helping other, you know i used to teach obviously kids mm -hmm. um just helping kids i guess find fun in learning because i think sometimes when you're in school you know depending on the way that you like to learn it can always be really boring of and it course. can you know like you don't enjoy it when you're in school but mm. I think it just depends how you learn and the things that you learn Definitely. I think if things that excite you then mm -hmm. yeah it's always it's always exciting now today's video is in partnership with a hot new brand that you should know all about and their name is Butterbox now Butterbox is a gift box of delectable African snacks it contains all your yummy favorites such as plantain chips roast ground nuts chin chin and the ones that take you all the way back like coconut candy koro koro and kuli kuli now there are five box options to choose from, ranging from the Vexi Money box all the way up to the Awambe box, which is suitable for larger groups. Head over to butterbox.com to order your box today. What is also your biggest challenge working on TV? I would say probably my biggest challenge in just working in broadcast television um, is probably for me was just trying to get in to mm, it. Yeah. I think it's, it's definitely an industry where it is a lot of who you know um, and you kind of really feel it once you're in and you don't, you know, you sort of, you don't know anybody else. I obviously, n nobody in my family, none of my friends at the time um, worked in television. I just didn't know how you got in. And I happened to have met this incredible woman who you've actually interviewed before, jo um, Joanna Abiei, who was amazing and at the time, and still is, but now she's doing it on a whole different scale. But at the time she was running this company, um, her first company called Shine Media, and it was basically trying to help diversify the TV industry, mm -hmm. um, which still is a massive issue today that Definitely, the TV industry yeah. is not as diverse mm -hmm. at all. Um, but I met Joanna and honestly, she was a godsend and she really helped push and just got me in and got me that kind of that first foot in the door. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I think that was before I met Joanna, I think that was really one of the biggest challenges that I faced was just trying to get in. Mm -hmm. um, TV is very freelance. Every you kind of it's quite rare to work for a company and your staff. So, you know, you don't have to worry about your next job. Everything's kind of in that sense taken care of everyone is pretty much freelance and there's lots of great benefits to that you can move to projects that you love you can um be your own boss in a sort of way but for me i'm very much um i like to know what's next like i i'm i'm, a, I'm quite risk averse so when i started in tv that was such a scary thing mm -hmm. and it still is to an extent because it means that you kind of have to be your own advocate no one's going to tell you oh it's time for a promotion you should you know move on to the next role or here's a pay rise because you've been at this company for x amount of years nobody does that like you have to push yourself so you have to be like actually i'm ready to move on from a researcher to an assistant producer actually i think i'm ready to ask for a pay rise i think i'm ready you know to have a next step up in pay you have to do all of those things yourself and then you have to negotiate that the the, the bright side of that is it teaches you a lot and you kind of you know gain a lot of confidence doing that but it takes a while to get there and i think that was something that i definitely struggled with and still struggle with now mm -hmm. um and just learning how to basically be your own advocate and really try to look out for your own best interest and help guide your career because there, there isn't really a system for it you just make decisions and you try the best you can to guide your career forward okay so yeah you worked in travel before covid how did you find it i worked on a show called travel man um mm -hmm. 
that so I did those shows before COVID, but I worked on another show that was also and, and had a lot of travel in it. And then COVID hit right bang in the middle, mm-hmm. and it was it was pretty scary because obviously, as you know, everybody knows when COVID first happened. Initially, everyone was like, oh, great, it's like two weeks and then we're all going to go back to normal. Mm. Obviously, then that didn't happen. And then the weeks kept on going, the months kept on going. We were like, oh, well, what are we going to do? And then all the lockdown started. Mm-hmm. Um, so we all then obviously started working from home. And it was it was a really big shift because we didn't know if the production was going to go forward. Every other day, we, you know, I was hearing from friends and different colleagues and our managers were telling us, this show we've just had this show's been cancelled we've just had this show's been cancelled mm-hmm. and essentially we were all like what's going to happen like you know we were literally just a little over halfway in our production that we were supposed to deliver we were all just planning to you know go out filming abroad <clears throat> and all of that basically got shut down but luckily um one thing that one of my um series producers at the time basically said he said that don't worry because our show is too big to fail, which I thought at first was like a bit ridiculous. Like, what are you talking about? There are whole companies like shutting down, but actually that kind of proved to be right. The production was huge and it's for Disney Plus and they had put so much money in already mm-hmm. that we were kind of at a stage where we just needed to do what needed to be done to, mm-hmm. to get the show made. Mm-hmm. So what ended up happening is um, the episode that we had to film right bang in the middle of lockdown, our company just decided to move our whole production to the country that we were supposed to film in. Mm. So normally, if we're filming somewhere, we're filming there for maybe two weeks, a mm. month tops. So. Yeah. Um, so you would do all your prep in the UK, in your office, and then you go out filming. What ended up happening was they were like, in, I think there was, a, um, there was a period in between one of the lockdowns, they were just like, everybody just, everybody's just gonna fly out to Iceland, which is where the episode was. Mm. And you're gonna do all your prep there and film there, and then we'll get you back. So the whole team, was flown out to Iceland mm-hmm. um, and were there for, I think it ended up being like nine weeks, wow. which yeah, was mm. costly for mm. the company. But that was what I think my boss's point was, was that um, at this stage, you kind of like Disney basically ended up having to put more money just to get the show over the line and get it finished rather than stopping and mm. kind of, you know, missing, basically losing out on the money they'd already invested in the of show. Course, so course. yeah, so COVID definitely threw a span in the works. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You had a panel meeting on the Royal Television Society talking about why should we care about PSB? Can you tell us more about it and how important it was to you? I have never been more nervous in my entire life um, than when I had to do that panel talk. I I basically, I so we got sent an, I was uh, in work, we got sent an email saying this talk, this talk is gonna happen. The Royal Television Society are looking for people that wanna be on the panel. I thought it was gonna be like, stupid me I thought it was going to be like not as a not a, that big of a deal so I was like oh okay I'll vol- and you know I'll put my name in it just you know so I basically emailed them and I was like yeah you know I'd be interested in talking about it mm-hmm. um then fast forward like two weeks later get an email back and they tell me who's on the panel and then they tell me what we're talking about and I was just like I I had never been so scared yeah. so the panel was basically made up of it was like the ex head of Ofcom who was obviously the, the Ofcom's like the regular um Terry body for or sort of complaints uh, exactly yeah. for like TVs and mm-hmm. kind of media within the UK so it was him he, I think his name's um Lord Vasey so he, again he's a lord and like you know the house of parliament mm-hmm. it was like um the ex editor of the guardian um it was the uh, director of a TV channel called STV. It just was all these really big people. And then all of a sudden I was like, wait, what am I doing? Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I can't talk about this in any sort of great like Mm -hmm. depth or anything like that. And I don't want to like look stupid. So basically I ended up having, I just, I just went into ultimate research mode and basically was just reading and reading and reading. Mm -hmm. I read like all of Ofcom's like, rules and kind of yeah. what they stood for. I read, I read like the um, the House of Par- Parliament had released some um, documents and all the channels, Channel 4 had released a document as well about PSB. Mm-hmm. So obviously PSB, um, public uh, broadcast services. So the ones like Channel 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just was like, I thought I was gonna go on there and be like, oh yeah, you know, do you prefer Channel 4 to Netflix or mm-hmm. Amazon Prime? And mm-hmm. I was gonna give, you know, just like my opinions. Yeah. but. I then realized obviously it's much more of a discussion and mm-hmm. I needed to know my stuff. So, but yeah, so basically ended up just researching a lot. So it was so scary, but actually I'm really glad that I didn't pull out and I stuck to it. Like my mum mm-hmm. was just like, no, you've got to do it. Mm-hmm. Because um, I think it put me 
um, it gave me confidence that I could actually speak about something, you know, as long as I had mm. the right preparation for it. Yeah. But also, um, I was obviously introduced to all the panel mm. members who were really great. Mm. And a couple of them emailed me after the panel discussion mm. um, just to kind of introduce themselves, Definitely. which was, again, was mm. a really good networking yeah. opportunity that of I didn't course. even know um, that was going to come of it. But mm. yeah, so it was actually, it was, it was important to me, but I only really sought that after the fact, before I, I mm. was... But, but I feel that you open a door. You bro, you open a door for that opportunity doing that because other people after you will do it. Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah. I hope so. I honestly, think, I, feel, I hope I, so. I honestly feel you open you doing it. Other person will say not if I Jennifer did it and she was comfortable doing it. I'll do it as well because it's an opportunity to help others who want to get into the industry or want to learn about the ins and out of Ofcom and all the other stuff. They'll feel more like. Confident to do it. I do. I do hope so because as as scary as it was, as Mm. much as you know, like I said, I was sweating. (laughs) As Mm. but I, I do hope that other people like do feel like they can take part in those kind of discussions. And actually, it's quite an interesting area, um, you know, of sort of like media and television that Mm. I think I definitely didn't obviously know a lot about before that. So yeah, I I, I, I hope. Yeah, I hope it has. Mm -hmm. I see you that that how women are breaking barriers and having a seat on table talk. (laughs) Um, how, how do you feel about this? I think it's so important for women to have seats at the table. Mm-hmm. And that just in terms of decision making roles and, dis, you know, have seats and have um, their voices and opinions be heard at the level of decision making. Because I think it's a lot of times and in a lot of industries, probably not just television or the media industries, a lot of the senior decision-making roles that actually have impact into how companies are run are quite male heavy. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just, yeah, I just think it's so important for that not to always be the case. For for, for women to be in the, not just women to be in like middle management or women to be, you know, in entry-level positions, which I think a lot of the times happens when companies are trying to diversify in in all aspects of diversity. They kind of bring people in that, entry level or middle management but the real decisions are made yeah. in those higher level positions and I think that's where women need to be we kind of our opinions and our voices need to be and our expertise need to be inputted in that in that level so yeah was- I, I definitely feel that as well I definitely feel the more women that get into the industry and open doors for other women to get through yes. it's a good opportunity because uh-huh. it, it goes to show especially with diversity as well it's good to show that that like, women can do things as well, get the opportunity to do things that they want to do as well, and yeah. and, and help each other climb up the ladder, kind of thing. A hundred percent. Do you know what it is? I like women have been doing things. Like mm. we've been doing the things. It's just it's never seen in the same light a lot of the time as a male, as, as a male yeah. when men do things. Mm. So and I th- so I think this is what I mean in terms when you were saying this in terms of bringing women up. Absolutely, because I think you then recognise in other women, what we already know we have the capability to do, um, to do and put that mm. on a spotlight that again, inspires and helps shapes another generation of, of people to want to do those things. Definitely. So yeah, mm. I think a lot of the times it's true that you can't like, you can't be what you don't see. Mm. And, and that's not true for everything and not for all people. But mm. I think if you see people like you, in those positions, you're like, you're much more likely to be like, wow, I can- Definitely do it. I can do that. Yeah, like I could be course. there, I could do what she's mm, doing. Definitely. So yeah, I yeah, I think it's important. What do you, What is the future of TV and the visual aspects of the media industry, especially considering the creation of Meta, Black Mirror, where will, where will it be in the next 10 years? Yeah, so that's actually one of, that was like the main point of that, that PBS conversation and the panel. I think, as we're finding out, and I actually was in a meeting at work, so I'm at the BBC now, we had a chat about mm-hmm. about it. I think companies um, are, especially TV companies, are slowly uh, coming to what has probably already been there for the last at least 10, 15 years, is that the way that people watch TV has changed of course. quite a lot. Mm. And um, the audiences that I think would have been attracted to a certain type of TV watching have now moved to like your Netflixes, your, yeah, like your streaming services. Mm -hmm. And like you just mentioned, like, you know, Facebook now to become a meta in the sort of space that they're gonna occupy in the kind of virtual world, it's just gonna continue changing. And I just think traditional TV needs to go along with that. There's, Mm -hmm. There's not really a place 
for traditional TV to just be like, no, nope, we're just going to stick to what we're doing and then people are going to... It's just, I think the wave is too big now. Mm. <laughs> like, you're just going to get swept along with it whether you of like course. it anyway. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So I just think in terms of, like, I, I guess I, I would see it more as not just TV, but just content mm-hmm. in, term, that's what, in terms of what we talked about earlier about, you know, my thing of like being a craver of content. I just think now it's creating content and putting it on platforms everywhere. Platforms include, you know, your channel, your BBC One, you know, ITV's Channel 4's, Channel 5's. Mm-hmm. But I just think you, we kind of start thinking about it in terms of just content creating and, and put content on platforms that match the content you're making because, you know, it's people are ranking watching something on Netflix and watching something on Amazon Prime or Hulu the same as watching something on BBC. Like it's the same kind of thing or watching something, you know, on your Facebook or Mm. watching something on IGTV. Like it's kind of the same thing now. So Mm. I don't, yeah, I think it's just more about creating really good content for people and they will watch it where they watch it. Definitely. What advice would you give to any up and coming creator of colour, director, any tips to break into the industry? I think I honestly would just say you just have to put yourself out there. Mm-hmm. And and that includes things like networking, like meeting people. And not just meeting people who are already made it or meeting people who are already really big in the like collaborating with your peers and with mm-hmm. your friends and just like networking within the people that are around you to create stuff. If you love filming, you love editing, you love directing, you love writing do those things with people that are around you. Mm-hmm. I think like a lot of times people always want to get like a mentor or someone who's already made it. Mm. And I think that's also a great way to do it. Mm. But there is such a power in working with people and collaborating with people that are around you and finding peers that are interested in the same things that you're interested in Definitely. and helping each other out mm. and then growing together. There's there's so much I think emphasis put on finding this kind of perfectly made person who's incredible, who's going to help me get there. Mm. And I think that's really good, but I do think there's a lot of power in just working with your peers. So yeah, so I'd say that, I'd say putting yourself out there in terms of reaching out to companies that you just enjoy their stuff. The amount of times that I would just email, even now, if I if there's a show or someone's made something, I'm like, that was incredible. I want to be able to work on something like that. Just reaching out, emailing companies to be like, I, you just made this thing that I love can I have a chat about opportunities for the next series or just opportunities at your company? Um, That's the thing I was saying about being your own advocate. Being a freelancer has really helped me with that in terms of just really putting yourself in positions and in places where you're seen and putting yourself in places where, you know, hopefully opportunity comes out of it. So yeah, so I think that's probably what I'd say is just really just put yourself out there in in all in all aspects mm-hmm. i see that you're living with sickle cell and you're an advocate for it how important is sickle cell awareness and what has life been living been like living with it i've got sickle cell mm-hmm. um disorder mm-hmm. and i think i didn't really start out being an advocate for it i remember um being in like high school and sort of like uni in my younger years and actually didn't really talk about it Mm. very much whatsoever because I think I was under the impression of like if people don't know then Mm. I can just pretend I'm normal and then no one's going to know that you're sick and I think there's a lot of Mm. um people always say that oh like it's great to be special and it's good to stand out and it is Mm. but I think when you have something that forces you to not be normal or not be like everybody else people look at you differently people look at you different so then you you exactly so you spend a lot of time Mm. just trying to fit in and just be normal and don't stand out so I think that's what I did a a lot in my high school years in that I was just like people don't know they can't see it so unless I'm sick I just won't say anything Mm. but as I've grown up obviously um I'd realized that that for me was a defense mechanism and mm. it's, it wasn't a healthy one. Yeah. Um, and I think it's so important and I'm so glad that I've had other advocates who obviously, you know, caught on to the, the right way of doing things way mm. earlier than I, I yeah. did. But I think it's important because it's a, it's a disorder that affects predominantly black people in our I community. Saw, I saw from it as well. Do you? But not the full blood. I've got, um, you've got the trait. trait. I've got the trait, yeah. Right. So mm. this, so exactly. So yeah. you've got the trait mm-hmm. and no, like, if nobody would ever know and to yeah. be honest you may not have even known if you maybe your parents or I don't know how you came about to know I knew it, when, you... I was, when I was young right like, okay my baby, my mom, my mom, you did the yeah. tests and st- yeah. right so it, it's a it's a disorder that affects like predominantly black, our community black and African black, community exactly yeah. uh, and I think it's also something that because like you said there are kind of various types to it and there's a trait mm. um, 
And if you didn't know and you met somebody and your partner, you're trying to have children and you, you know, your mm-hmm. partner didn't know, yes. you there the odds the, of you having then a child that has sickle cell that has, you know, the full blown, as they say, full yeah. blown dis- disorder like I do, mm. you just wouldn't know. And I think the in in being an advocate or in sort of people being adv- um, advocates for it, yeah. I just think information is so key. And Definitely. I think if you know something, mm. you can better prepare for it Definitely. and also i think it helps in terms of just how you treat people and mm-hmm. how you know i mean you should be nice to people anyway all Definitely. the time course, but i just i think if you know about something and if mm-hmm. you know it just there can never be a bad side of having the information mm-hmm. so i think that's why for me it's now been important for me to be able to like just talk about just my experience every, everyone mm-hmm. deals with their illness every sickle cell yeah. patient deals with their illness Definitely. very differently the only, only issues i have with it is that when it, in the winter like my, i have to wear loads of clothes in the winter because yes. i get cramped in my legs and yeah. that's the kind of symptoms i get but it's not too bad right okay over yeah. the last couple of years i haven't really affected me that much but okay i feel like i'm getting better over it now but before when i was younger I was going for a lot of pain in the winter. Yeah. Yeah. Knee were hurting, back. Cramps. Yeah, yeah, it's mm. it's yeah, it's a, it's a, it's. I mean, I think I I've, I've always like not joked about it, but I think like I use humor in, mm. in a lot of things just to kind of help me get over. But yeah, no, it's it's serious. Like it's it serious. such a yeah, it's such a debilitating disease, mm. and I think a lot of times because people can't see it when they look at you to be like, oh, mm. you might have something. You can't see it, Definitely. but I think people don't think it's yeah. that serious. No. But when you're hit with it, mm. like sickle cell doesn't care if you had plans doesn't care if you mm. need to go to school if you've got mm. exams if you, it just it's literally your whole entire world stops Definitely like 100%. everything stops yeah. because you're in pain mm. and it's the sort of pain that it's so hard to describe to anybody it's, it's the a, intense it's a, it's a sharp hit it's like like, it's very, like the intensity yeah. of that pain mm. is so difficult to explain yeah. like it's yeah so i just i think people knowing about it and people know about the severity mm. of it is um very important is really really Definitely. really important because I, I had a family yeah. member on my mom's side she told me that he passed away from it when he was about 33 right yeah. 32 30. do you have a lifespan of how long you can they say that patients with sickle cell don't tend to live like as long as like a help their healthier counterparts mm. um i obviously for my own probably selfish and personal reasons try not to take that to like no, kind I don't, of I don't take because that either, i just no. you know i've Mm. I've met sickle cell patients who are well into their 80s. Mm. You know, just like anybody, like your lifestyle, anything can happen to anybody. Obviously, a lot of it, you know, being with, having sickle cell is how you manage your condition. Of course. Um, and kind of what, what services um, you have available to you in terms of your doctors and, you know, mm. your care plan and things yeah. like that. But yeah, like they do say that there is a kind of reduced um, life expectancy but that, there. But when that happened to them, that was a year, that was not in the eight, that was like in the eighties. Like it wasn't like now, now it's, everything's advanced now. Things have, then, yeah. well, things have improved slowly. Like mm. as in, not as fast as when you think about the, the sort of research and money that goes into like different diseases and you know research and cures into other conditions sickle cell has never had that level of never. funding never. that level of um yeah like just like awareness like mm. it just it feels like something that you know sometimes like oh it just happens to those people so you know leave them, leave them it, it does yeah. feel like that like mm. it's literally only in the last few months that there's been a new um treatment that's been um that's been approved yeah it's taken decades for that to happen and that's still not a cure it's just a treatment it's just mm-hmm. managing your pain and managing um kind of the condition but not a treatment and i so i do i do think that's another reason why the advocacy and people just knowing about it is important so i think if people know about it um as well as obviously just being able to know from personal information I just hopefully it brings attention to get more funding and more research, Definitely. but also things like blood drives and getting, you know, people with sickle cell disorders a lot of times need blood donation, like kind of, you know, need blood donation just to live normal, of relatively course. healthy lifestyles. Yeah. So I think knowing about it and the community knowing about it hopefully increases things like getting blood donors, um, yeah, just out there. So really important.